The afternoon's first speaker is Brian Ashby. He is an administrator at the University of Chicago's South Asia Language and Area Center. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Chicago. Brian's research has focused on the extraction of natural resources such as metals, gems, and woods, and their role in civil wars in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Brian has spent the past three years producing a feature-length documentary film, Scrappers, which can be found at www.scrappersmovie.com, which shows the experiences of two of Chicago's self-employed scrap metal scavengers and their families. It also provides an analysis of the Chicago scrap recycling industry. His talk will trace the roots of two basic metals from extraction through recycling across the globe and review the included lesson materials. Please join me in welcoming Brian Ashby. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, yes, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is metals. Uh, you know, how do we get them out of the ground and uh, where and how do they go to become something else once we're done using them as products? So, um, yeah, Sarah introduced me. My research as an international relations student was on natural resource extraction and civil wars. I'm going to be talking to you on that end about the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And uh, then I'm also a filmmaker. I've spent a lot of time here um, studying recycling in Chicago, in particular the uh, informal scrappers. So um, we've heard a lot about um, the life cycles of natural resources at the Institute already. Um, very complex scientific models of them. I'm going to talk about it in just sort of four simple conceptual steps. Uh, first would be extraction of minerals when we get them out of the ground. Second would be production, making them into the goods uh, that we use. The third would be use of consumer products. And the last uh, would be recycling. I am, so the middle two of those, production and use, are pretty difficult to understand, uh, especially in our current age of globalization, because they involve the supply chain. Um, hundreds of com companies, people, are involved in getting uh, <clears throat> the goods you use to you in, in the form you use them. So I figure it's, it's, uh, it's quite useful to focus on the first and the last part of the, of the life cycle, which would be extraction and recycling. So uh, our goal here is to understand the entire cycle, the life cycle of metals, uh, which is not the goal of understanding the supply chain in the middle. That basically functions on specialization and division of labor, and you want to know how your chain in the supply chain works. But uh, from an educational standpoint, we want to be able to think about the entire world economy. So that's basically, uh, you know, first an educational goal in itself. Um, if your students want to know um, about their immediate physical surroundings, their built environment, how it gets that way, and uh, what kind of things in what part of the world uh, make your lifestyle possible. And the second would be um, to learn critical thinking by uh, coming up with a framework to understand something as big as uh, the role of resources in the, the entire global economy. And uh, yeah, lastly, before I start, I just want to say, you know, I think it's, it's quite helpful to think about things in a cycle instead of a linear fashion. So in that reason, I, foc I focus on metals in particular because uh, metals are infinitely recyclable. Uh, they don't have any structural memory. Um, it's always been that you can turn metals into something else once you're done with it. It's always going to be that way for thousands of years. That's a bit different from other resources we use, like petrochemicals that we burn and send into the atmosphere never to see again, or um, plastics, woods, textiles, things that we form into something, and it, it you know, requires quite a lot of labor to use them over again. So for that reason, I find uh, metals particularly interesting. And uh, it's also worth pointing out that uh, metals are already recycled quite a bit. Uh, just a few brief statistics on that is that two-thirds of the steel used in the U.S. is already coming from recycled sources, and 40% uh, of all the metals used in uh, production in the U.S. are coming from recycled sources. You can compare that to all of the other products we use on a daily basis, which are sort of almost nil recycling. And uh, the last thing I want to say before I start is um, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I think about uh, research and storytelling being pretty similar. Uh, so I think it's quite useful if students can grasp, uh, you know, people's stories on either end of this life cycle of uh, natural resources and use that as a goal towards, towards comprehending the bigger picture. So, right, that's me. So to start with, this is a pretty simple point. 
everything uh, around us comes out of the ground at one point or another, but I think it's quite useful to be reminded of that. On the right, uh, that's a poster from the, uh, I think it's the Mineral Education Institute, but it just reminds you if it can't be grown, it has to be mined. And uh, up here, this is uh, from Alcoa, the major producer of the world's aluminum, shows sort of a lump of dirt being turned into a plane, which I think is a pretty evocative graphic. And, uh, you know, if you're in the classroom, you can think about this even in terms of the things that are all around you. Quite, quite a puzzle to think about how did you actually get them. So that's, that's the basic level I really want to be starting from. Uh, we've talked about consumption quite a lot in this institute already, but I think it's worth just talking about again. It's a little strange. Um, the Geological Survey has uh, posited that this is the amount of um, minerals that each American would use in an average year. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not obvious. Uh, you're using all of that stone and sand and gravel on the roads you drive on, in the house you live in, you're using the petroleum in your car. These ones are pretty obvious. But I think this has a lot of value in terms of, um, say, assigning case studies to your students. Maybe they can find out what they're doing with their six pounds of manganese or their third pound of uranium, because I certainly don't know <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm doing with mine. Uh, the other thing that, that's been gone over quite a lot already in this institute is the, uh, the idea of ecological footprints. Uh, we've talked about it sort of, uh, sort of back and forth, but this is one that is specific to mining. Uh, it's put together by this uh, Danish environmental group, and it basically compiles statistics about how much earth needs to be extracted, moved, processed, or destroyed in order to get the minerals that we use. Uh, you can see with aluminum, uh, we're dealing with 20% more earth with copper, you're dealing with 350 times more, and, and with gold, you're dealing with this totally unbelievable figure. And uh, I thought it was just interesting that you could uh, find out that all of the gold that humanity's ever mined, if you put it together, could fit in a box of 72 foot size, which means you could basically put it in this room. Uh, so I won't, uh, you know, beat the concept of environmental footprints to death anymore, but um, I think, it, you know, it is useful to teach them all together. We've talked about uh, carbon footprints, water footprints, mineral footprints. You know, if you talk about all of the footprints that each of your students have, it's, it's quite a lot of feet you're talking about. And uh, the goal here is not to say that uh, mining is bad or evil or necessarily ecologically problematic. Uh, for, you know, for example, this picture of nickel tailings looks quite menacing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's poisoning the landscape or that's being handled in an ecologically um, irresponsible manner, but the idea is that students could learn to uh, take statistics with a grain of salt, question, am I seeing the big picture? For example, the statistics I just showed you in the last slide about consumption, they would ask, is that actually what I'm consuming? Actually, you're consuming this much. You can ask, you know, what, what does a series of statistics not tell me? I think that's a useful critical thinking tool for students. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk a bit about the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, first, uh, you know, so everybody knows where is it. It's this red country in the uh, sort of exact center of Central Africa, um, perhaps most popularized in Joseph Conrad's uh, Heart of Darkness. Uh, it's also covered almost entirely with really dense rainforests. We heard about the Congo a bit earlier today in terms of the lungs of the world. And uh, the thing about Congo is that it's very rarely in the news in America, despite the fact it is one of the largest countries in Africa. It's home to vast amounts of natural resources that we as Americans use every day in our, you know, our daily lives. And uh, it's also <clears throat> been the site of an international war that's involved uh, the armies of nine or ten different countries and it's been going on for the past 15 years. It's uh, the worst humanitarian disaster in the history of the 20th century, but hardly ever hear about it. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about those natural resources and some of the problems that are associated with its extraction. One is uh, child labor, which we can see right here. That's a child mining gold. So basically this is a slide full of um, just sort of brief talking points about the Congo. You don't necessarily need to read all this. Um, but basically I want to give you uh, just some ideas that sort of turn your head and briefly summarize and simplify a conflict like this. It's the deadliest conflict since World War II. It's killed almost over five million people, uh, more than half of those since the war's official end. The thing about this conflict, why it's not in the news, is because it's really complicated. It's quite confusing. It involves hundreds of, uh, of warring parties. It's kind of hard to display it in the news in the same way that we tend to talk about Sudan, you know, with sort of good guy versus bad guy. It's really not possible to do that. 
Um, but it's a really horrible situation. And um, basically, in terms of teaching natural resources, I see it as an opportunity to kind of sneak in a history lesson that I would imagine students aren't really getting anywhere else. So I'd really, you know, uh, I'm talking about DRC because I'd uh, really, really encourage you to use it as a case study. And um, I'll just mention that there are more slides uh, at the end of my presentation, like a lot of the other presenters I've conceptualized this as something you can download later. So I won't go into, you know, the whole history of the Congo or anything, but there's lots of curriculum out there. Uh, Center for International Studies actually produced uh, a lesson unit recently on accountability in contemporary wars, dealing with child soldiering, with rape, with blood resources. That's available on their site. Uh, it was done in conjunction with a workshop with Jamie Briggs, who wrote a really popular book about child soldiers. Okay, so the big question for us is why is this conflict dragged on so long? The reason is because there's big prizes involved. Those prizes are natural resources, particularly metals. Often in the Congo, they're hiding just beneath the surface of the earth. They're quite easy to get to. So I'm going to move on a bit and tell you just what those are. Uh, so the reason I broke this up into a couple slides focusing on different, um, different regions of the Congo itself is because it seems like a good opportunity to get in another uh, geography lesson in general, you know, where fighting in the Congo has been the heaviest. And also, secondly, if you teach Africa to focus on kind of the porousness, the arbitrariness, and the sort of lack of meaning of national borders when you're talking about post, you know, post-colonial Africa. So really these places are kind of fiefdoms in, the, in and of themselves. They're ruled politically in a lot of cases by the people who control mines. That can be rebel groups, uh, government allied soldiers, foreign armies, or usually sort of a combination of all of the above. And then also, uh, it's such a resource-rich country, it's such a large country, it's got really huge deposits of different things in different places. Um, so the few things we're going to be talking about are uh, tantalum and cassiterite. Um, nearly all of the known reserves currently of tantalum, uh, tantalums and elements, you know, on the periodic table, are located in the Congo. And I just want to point out it's also frequently referred to in the news of coltan. It's actually found in an ore called columbite, and then the sort of residue in which you find that is called coltan. And cassiterite is basically just a source or a way to get tin. So basically, we're talking about tin. This is what tantalum looks like at the end of the day. It's a black powder. So why do we care about any of this? Uh, the reason is because tantalum and considerate are used in almost all of the consumer electronics that we use on a daily basis. That's nearly every cell phone, uh, PDA, laptop, PlayStations, sort of you name it. The reason is because it's a lightweight and heat resistant capacitor. It's really enabled us to make things smaller, make this kind of high tech weightless economy that we live in, all really due to this one mineral. And, uh, you know, the reason I find this particularly interesting is just because sort of high technology and, and smaller devices are not necessarily moving us, in, you know, into a safer or cleaner world. They're not necessarily less complicated than things like coal, nuclear power. We've got the same sort of environmental and human consideration to take into account when we're talking about where we get this stuff. And, uh, you know, I feel like a lot of times people think that the more complicated their products are, uh, the less they could possibly comprehend them. But when we're dealing with stuff like tantalum coming out of the DRC, it's really, it's really quite a simple story. It's quite a direct story. It's one you can teach. Uh, the price on the world market of these minerals really has driven conflict there and has kept it from being resolved. So I'm also going to talk about cassiterite, which is tin. These two really go together. Um, Tins used in solder, I bet a lot of you guys know that. And uh, it's a really fascinating case study um, that when we started to make solder more um, sort of environmentally and health friendly, it, it uh, so it took the lead out, put a lot more tin in, and we can see the direct results of these swings in market forces in places where this stuff comes from. So. Um, yeah, uh, Dan Brinkmeyer on one of the other days was discussing, you know, irony. How, how can we see irony in world affairs? It is a bit ironic that we think we're moving forward and making things better for us, better for the environment, but somebody somewhere is dealing with this. Somebody's still providing it for us. And I think it's definitely less ironic. It's tragic. 
But uh, what, what it is is that we're denying uh, sort of basic tenets of the education of economics, which is that everything is a trade-off. For some reason in our society, when we want to talk about environmentally positive things, we tend to deny that, that things are trade-offs. So I think with stuff like high-tech devices like this, we're often comparing our sort of best ideal world we want to live in, technologically, environmentally, and we're ignoring the fact that it comes from really the worst real-world situation in terms of conflict, oppression, and misery in which the extraction of our, our resources are mixed up. So I, yeah, I do want to just focus on trade-offs, and I think you can teach your students that you know there aren't easy answers in the world. If they feel like they can develop their critical capacity to criticize or critically understand sort of current fads and language in the world, you know, for example, about products that are ecologically friendly, then you know they're real, real critical thinkers. And uh, the last thing is that just we, we start to be able to see things like this happening due to globalization. We can see, due to our communications networks, the consequences of swings in the market value of commodities, for example, so much quicker. And basically that just, all it does is point out how much we were initially ignoring it. It gives us less of an excuse to say we don't know. I'm going to talk about just the second region of the Congo, which is in the southeast. Um, these are sort of more basic minerals, copper and cobalt, which are used in a much wider array of products, all kinds of stuff. But uh, the reason I, I want to talk about this stuff, for example, like this kind of complicated thing here about heterogeneite ore, is that um, I know the Summer Institute's really focused on this, these lessons in international education being useful for science teachers. I think you know, these are highly applicable lessons for natural sciences, for chemistry, flipping in case studies. And uh, this is a map I pulled off Google. I'd read in a study that uh, copper reserves in southeastern DRC were visible from space, so I wanted to see if that was true. Pulled off this map, and I think, um, you know, there they are. <laughs> um, this Katanga province is a really interesting lesson in political geography, too. If that's something you teach, you can see um, how this peninsula kind of butts into neighboring uh, Zambia, and you can sort of have your students wonder how borders get drawn that way <coughs> around deposits of natural resources. And that part of uh, Zambia is indeed called Copper Belt Province. So the major commodity uh, we hear about in the news in, in campaigns trying to deal with these issues are cell phones. And we want to know why is it such a problem? basically because of the amazing growth in the market for these devices. So you can read some of these statistics. Uh, even in 2005, I can only imagine how it's grown since. We were producing a cell phone every 25 seconds, replacing them once a year. Almost a third of the people in the world have got them. And uh, this is an interesting one about programs in the U.S., despite the fact that you know, manufacturers are pressured to take their phones back. It, it really doesn't happen too much. And the thing that I think is, is so important about these minerals that end up in small technologically advanced electronics is that they're not uh, comprehensible in the same way that, say, blood diamonds are. It's, it's really not up to you as a consumer to make choices that, that could affect this. Um, even, in, you know, you need a cell phone, but there's no way to buy a cell phone that wouldn't have this in it. And uh, basically, I, I think that's a really important uh, for students, because I think stuff like blood diamonds is maybe easy answers if you, you know, teach students that their individual sort of consumer preferences really do matter, um, and maybe to the detriment of thinking about social problems. These are things that we all share in as a world together, and we're going to have to come up with group solutions. So I feel like that kind of thinking is rather important. Um, and I, I do have a bunch more material about the Congo in the back that I don't want to get into now, but um, just thinking about certain concepts about how you can teach this kind of stuff, why the world is this way, uh, really about the way transportation infrastructure is lacking, how corruption works, and you know, how these goods get to us. So I'd encourage you to just look in the back if you really do want to teach that material. Um, do you want to just talk really quickly about what this mining is actually like? Uh, it's really labor intensive. Um, if you're an economics teacher, you can teach this in terms of things that are labor versus capital intensive, why do certain industries develop certain ways in different parts of the world. 
so it's almost done entirely by hand, by people who are just responding to market conditions and know that they can drastically increase their income by doing this. So it's people digging open pits, which may just be themselves digging a hole in the ground that's six feet deep, sort of mining and flushing to get those alluvial deposits, or it may be something like this, hundreds of feet deep, just using manual label, labor to carry things up in like a fireman's bucket. This is the kind of stuff we're dealing with. Um, a lot of it's child labor, and it's, it's just all over the place. And clearly this has environmental consequences for the Democratic Republic of Congo too. It um, has been responsible for destroying quite a lot of habitat of endangered primates, protected national parks, stuff like that. I think it just sort of compa you know, pales in comparison to the human cost. I thought it's pretty important to just see, in fact, what we're talking about. So before I get done with the Congo, which will be soon, I just want to talk a bit about what's going on right now. How can we think about, about our role in this and what we can do? So right now, um, in fact, just a couple of months ago, we've passed this Congo Conflict Minerals Act. Or, I'm sorry, not passed. It's, it's under consideration right now. Um, you know, maybe 10 years after this started to be a serious world problem, but it's under consideration by the U.S. legislature. And if you teach international relations or politics, you can really get your students thinking about things like sanctions, bans, um, you know, sort of registration. Do these, do these things really work? Are they humane? Maybe if you're teaching in other, other lessons about sanctions on Iraq, Somalia, Burma, North Korea, Sudan, anything like this. Um, if you're teaching public policy, it's about, you know, sort of ability to regulate human behavior, if you cut this off, is it just that the bad guys who forge registration tickets for minerals continue to make money while miners don't? You know, what's going to happen? These are way too complex questions for a student to really answer, but if they can learn to articulate an argument one way or the other, why they think sanctions can affect, you know, the course of a conflict or why they think, you know, they punish individual people, then I think they've really accomplished something. So there are, you know, just a little bit of figures about how much money can be made by miners in the Congo. So, it, you know, it does seem a bit inhumane to really cut off that flow of living that if managed responsibly and communally could be a source of revenue for the most resource-rich countries in the world. Another one, um, you know, I feel like the goal of the Summer Institute is to say if we want to talk about the solutions to global problems, we really have to look at market forces. So this is about the other major producer of tantalum, which is an Australian company. Uh, has a very complex relationship with the supply of tantalum coming out of the Congo. And um, again, it's, it's rather uh, too complex of a question to answer these, these questions I've put at the end. But if, if students studying economics or international relations can really come up with an argument about what they think is going to happen, they can develop a vocabulary of you know, market and political forces in the world that they can use to make predictive claims about how things are going to happen in the world. You know, how are current affairs going to resolve themselves? If you know where to look, you can start learning how to think. And, uh, you know, I would encourage anyone to use these as real problems if they think, uh, if they think their students could do it. Okay, so that's, um, that's what I'm going to say about the extraction side for now. I, you know, I think I've told you why I think that case is particularly important when we're looking at the beginning part of the cycle of natural resources. Like I said, I'm going to skip over the middle two phases, which are the production and use of goods, and talk about the end, which is recycling, so we can keep thinking about this as a cycle. So what happens next? Things come literally from a quarry, get turned by millions and millions of people and companies into the things we use every day. Some are more simple, some are more complicated. Coins, you know, are made out of one type of mineral or an alloy. Hummer has many thousands of things in it. And um, I think it's really fruitful to assign these kind of case studies to students. If each student in your class can come up with a good little bit of research about where one particular raw commodity or one particular consumer product comes from, just think about, you know, as much that they could learn from each other. Then we use the stuff. and uh, all kinds of different things. And of course, when we're talking about cycles and these phases of the, of the life cycle of a commodity or a natural resource, things spend different amounts of time in different parts of the cycle. So clearly, you know, this building being made out of rebar, those materials are going to be in use a lot longer than, you know, the bullets in this machine gun. They're going to literally fall back to the ground. Somebody's going to find them and recycle them over again. Um, the reason I think we're so interested in things like cell phones and high technology that are changing every day is because we're using them so quickly, and that begs the question of whether we're going to recycle them or not. 
And, uh, you know, of course, this, this ties into a lot bigger questions of product design. Uh, sustainability has been a big theme here. If you can manage to teach, you know, natural resources together and how they come out of the ground and then put it together with a kind of holistic lesson of how our stuff is actually put together. Is it going sort of cradle to grave, cradle to cradle? You know, is it going in a cycle? Is it just going in a landfill? Um, those questions are really begged by use, and I just want to point out how it relates to the other parts of the cycle, which are extraction and recycling. So I'm going to get on to recycling, uh, which is where I've sort of done my work, and I'm going to talk about Chicago, because, you know, what, what better lab, what better landscape than, than our own city to teach some lessons. Uh, so I'm wondering if any of you guys have ever seen these people before. These are scrappers in Chicago. Uh, so Chicago has been home to a huge informal labor force of uh, sort of thousands of individual recyclers who make their own commercial vehicles, sort of adapt them with high walls and stuff, and just search out metals day and night. They do it in our alleyways. They do it by making contacts with smaller industries, like auto parts, small manufacturing. They do it by just meeting people who are landlords who do moves, and people really make a living this way. And so I've spent, uh, yeah, the past couple of years uh, filming two of these guys and their families and sort of trying to deal with the uh, political economy of scrappers by, by viewing their lives. And uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, but of course uh, I want to get into the fact that the incentive that's making this possible for individual small-scale recyclers comes from the global economy came from demand <clears throat> in Asia, mostly in China, as we underwent a housing boom and a construction boom and the whole rest of the world did too. On China, in China, that was on a scale much larger than ours. Um, I will continue talking about it a bit more, but that drove up the price of metal commodities to the degree that it actually made sense to drive around in a truck and find stuff, and you could make an honest living that way. All right, so I want to introduce you to just the concept of trash as a valuable natural resource. In some ways, it's rather simple. Uh, trash is made out of the same resources <laughs> we're talking about already. They've just been used up and called something else. Um, so if you answer yes to this question, are you interested in what happens to your trash, where does it go, then you need to find out, you know, who's taking it, what they're doing with it, and why. So as much as always in understanding uh, forces in the global economy, you need to, to learn about actors, you need to know about people, and you need to know about their incentives. So the reason I make a distinction um, between waste haulers and recyclers here is because it's not immediately obvious. When you think about uh, recycling programs that are run by cities, it's these same guys, the waste haulers, you know, who are doing it. They've got the trucks already, they've got the labor, kind of seems like it makes sense, but in some ways it doesn't. Waste haulers are paid by pickup fees because they're dealing with materials that we find undesirable. Um, our rotten food, our dirty diapers, you know, everything we need to get out of our city to make the urban landscape livable. Um, so people who recycle are paid by weight. They're not paid by picking it up. So these guys, their incentive is to take something to a landfill. These guys, their incentive is to deliver it to somebody who's going to melt it down and turn it into a new product. And the idea is not to say that waste haulers are bad, they're really commendable for the work they're doing, but are they the type of people we want recycling? And basically I bring this up because I want to say that recyclers come in all shapes and forms. They come in the city running the blue bag program and they come in the form of these guys. And um, yeah, just to talk about incentives a little bit, I'm talking about incentives. Um, modeling incentives you know, involves complicated math and learning economics, but trying to, you know, parse out and understand what somebody's incentive is and argue for why that's the case is just a matter of common sense, and that's the kind of economics education I feel like you want to imbue in somebody even if you're not teaching sort of math-related economics. And uh, just sort of if you need any proof to understand why this is the case, I mean, just ask yourself, why would a guy like this go around picking stuff up for free, whereas a waste hauler, you know, charges you a fee to do it? The answer is that he's got a financial incentive to do it. The more he gets, the more he gets. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about scrappers in particular as being global informal labor. Um, and I'm talking about Chicago. I'm keeping it very local. I thought 
how much more local could we get than this photo? This is taken at Rockefeller Chapel, which is about two blocks from where we're standing. Uh, they had replaced their organ a couple years ago, and these are the old organ pipes coming out. So the interesting thing about this is that these are not demolition contractors sort of registered and hired by the University of Chicago. These are just freelancers who happen to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> so what do, we, what do we mean when we're talking about informal labor? And uh, yeah, just sort of, sort of as an interesting note, I talked to a scrap dealer um, about this very scenario in the picture, and the pipes are made out of like a really, really valuable alloy of brass mixed with uh, phosphorus, I think. And these guys probably netted a couple thousand dollars from, from doing this job. So like I said before, from 2003 to 2008, <clears throat> this is a five-year period we're dealing with that roughly coincides in the global financial system with just this huge boom period that we saw in America in terms of housing and construction. Um, anyone who teaches China, teaches Asia, knows quite a lot about what that growth meant over there. I was trying to think about one statistic in particular that would sum this up eloquently, and I was thinking about all the new cities that have been fabricated on the Chinese landscape. So not a statistic about how many have been made, but I do have this one about this 2020 mandate, which is 400 new cities in China from 2000 to 2020. So if you think about that in terms of just pure raw materials that are required to make buildings, uh, you know, we're talking about rebar, we're talking about plumbing, uh, talking about stone and granite, of course. Just think about what that means. And so why is China getting its recycled metals from us? Um, they're trying to regulate their growth to keep it from overheating, like just happened to all of us in the world with the global financial meltdown. They're trying to preserve their own raw resources. Um, you know, communist or at least semi-communist country now, they've still got an advanced plan. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, the economics of, of shipping under globalization and why it's so cheap for our stuff to go back there as a as a, a raw material. And I did say this is informal labor. I just want you to know a little bit about what that means. That means this is completely untaxed. This isn't reflected in our gross national product. This is just people doing money, uh, doing work, getting money for contracts that they establish usually verbally. So all of these scrappers are going to go to a scrapyard. They're going to get paid in cash. Um, there's hundreds of these yards in Chicago. Um, at the peak of this must have been a sort of labor force of thousands of the scrappers. Do they put it on their tax return? Well, it's up to them. Um, I say probably not. So I think um, if any economics teachers want to do a unit about the informal sector in America, it'd be really interesting. It's something we don't tend to talk about a lot for reasons I talk about here. It's, it's more associated with things that are not only illegal but, but illicit, and this is not the same. So this is a price, uh, a graph reflecting the price of copper on uh, the global market uh, as reflected by the London Metals Exchange. That's a major stock exchange for dealing with metal commodities over the past, um, let's see, this goes back from right now to 2000, from January 09 to 2000. So if I showed you this graph even uh, one year ago or less than one year ago, it would just look like a total joke. It would look like an arrow going up <laughs> into infinity forever. So uh, these prices um, on the graph are in dollars per metric ton. That's a bit confusing. I've put a few prices here, just dollar per pound. This is the historical average for the price of copper. This baseline is $1.30 a pound. You can see between 2003 and 2006 what an incredible growth we're dealing with. And then between 2006 and 2008, what a sort of feast you know, it was for scrap recyclers. And that's the same for these informal laborers I'm talking about and cities. I, you know, I think it's important if you want to teach recycling with anything else to look to market forces. Um, cities are able to offer recycling programs because they sell the recycling. They sell the recyclable materials to private industry who make it into something else. So you know, that's the same distinction I pointed out before between waste haulers and recycle, recyclers. So then what happened here in, um, let's see, they've got it pegged as July 08, that's about right, but, you know, all of the commodities markets sort of crashed at once. They'd been immune from the financial crisis for a long time because as the economy got worse, uh, the price of raw materials kept going up. But at some point, you know, that bubble was going to burst after the other bubbles, and it did. Um, so what happened here in late 2008 is this trade of scrapping is completely wiped off the face of the map. It's no longer, 
you know, valuable to do. You've gone back, you know, sort of several years in value and people who stake their livings on that just no longer can do it. That, again, is the same for city municipal recycling programs. You've probably heard a lot about that side of it in the news. Um, there's a lot of instability in those markets where people who buy and sell recyclable goods are not selling to each other because they don't know what's going to happen. For example, you know, they got orders from China at one price. Markets crashed in literally a couple days, and, you know, Chinese companies didn't want to complete those orders, as, as you can only imagine. So the response to this shock, you know, hasn't come back yet. And the thing is, it's probably never going to come back because these high prices are due to the bubble in the economy. So you're going to see this stuff come back up to the historical average. You can see it already at the very tail end of the graph. And it's going to be kind of business as usual like it was from 2003 backwards through probably the past 30 years or something. But I want to point this out because uh, here in my text, it, it brings these two sides of the cycle together. People who are dealing with natural resources, uh, particularly metal commodities, at the points in their life cycle when they're turning in from one thing to another, you know, when they're coming out of the ground into something you can buy and sell, or when they're being recycled, those things, like I said at the start, are based on commodity price and weight. And um, these people all have their lives staked on it. People who are bigger players, they have savings, they have equity, they can deal with that. If you're a miner in the Congo or you're a scrapper in the alleys of Chicago, you can't. And so, you know, if you're teaching globalization, you can just talk about who gets hurt the most. I mean, if you're teaching the financial crisis, who in America, which industries, which classes, you know, which sort of derivative industries got hit the hardest, it has to do with fluctuating commodity prices. And not just in the crash, you know, with the regular swings of the business cycle, but here particularly badly because for some reason I think in the scrap world people didn't see that this was a bubble in the same way that people on housing did. Well, a lot of them didn't either, but it just sort of happened overnight. Okay, so this is again, I mean, you don't have to read this sort of complicated text, but I think that when we're talking about these metals, uh, this is really applicable to science lessons. Um, if you want to talk about natural science, physics, or whatever, these processes are really interesting, really complex. Uh, the way I think this photo is great, you can look at a literal pile of junk, you know, pile of household junk, and see the value coming out of it. In this case, you know, bursting out of it. Um, before we were dealing with all this high technology and science, scrap dealers are a real kind of class of people who learned how to do this over the past 50 years or something, just analyzing different alloys and mixes of metals by touch, sight, smell even. As, uh, unlike, you know, people who work in industry making products who have advanced ways to assure the purity of what they're dealing with, you know, these guys are buying off the street. Uh, it's sort of a really hectic in the moment kind of thing, which is exactly like it is when you take metals out of the ground and you sell it to the first middleman. You know, people got to know what they're talking about, and it's sort of an amazing skill to have. Oh, I'm actually just going to get to that. Um, let's see, in a couple slides, but um, things are generally kind of well, it's a mix. If something's going to be reused again here in the U.S., if it's going to go to a steel foundry or something, it's done here. Um, but a lot of things, it's, it's a lot cheaper to, to do in China because of the labor cost. Something, you know, if you can analyze a certain percentage of what it is and sell it based on that, and, you know, your buyer is going to be sure that they get that percentage, then it'll go to China, and people are going to take it apart by hand, which is something I'm definitely going to talk about. But um, the scrappers in Chicago, the guys in the trucks, I mean, they, they do a lot of this labor themselves, too. It's really hard work. When they're just waiting in line at the scrapyard, they're going to take stuff apart. Again, just not, not because they feel like it's nicer that way, because they get a real incentive to do it. If they sell a refrigerator, you know, they get the, you know, the iron uh, ferrous metal price, which is very, very low. If they take the sort of, um, you know, freon element in different, different metal elements out of the, you know, freezer unit and stuff, they sell those separately. So to some degree, it's all broken down here. Um, it's kind of packed and bailed and sorted by some of these simpler processes here. When you're dealing with stuff like automotive parts and like computer chips, those are mostly done abroad, and that's, that's something I'm going to talk about. Um, it's a little complicated economic stuff that I'm not going to go into um, really in depth. Uh, you can read it now or later if you want, but uh, I feel like it's 
it's pretty important uh, when you, you want to ask your students, you know, how is it possible that, that globalization works? How is it that we can ship, you know, a huge container from here to China for a few hundred bucks? Why did they come here full and go back empty? That's what's making this whole economy possible, and it's indirectly making it valuable for people to actually go out on their own with no sort of support or business backing and just find metals. It's from Chinese demand. And, you know, how does that work? It just seems to boggle the mind. Um, we did also hear a little bit earlier in the agricultural presentation about futures trading in the derivatives market. I feel like this is really good if it's something you're going to teach already. But, you know, how do we turn the money we have into more money? <laughs> That's the biggest question at the root of all finance practice, at the financial crisis, et cetera. And commodity traders do it more than anybody. And people who work in scrap are dealing with commodities just like people are doing oil futures, pork bellies, you know, whatever. Just like the scrappers, commodity trading is something that's really rooted in Chicago. It was invented here. Most of it's done here. So between the uh, economics of shipping between here and Asia and leveraging money on hedging your bets on an order, that's how we turn this into really, really big money. And that's how the scrap dealers offer a higher price to the guy on the street. Um, so this isn't something I think is, uh, you know, necessarily of educational value, but I wanted to tell you uh, just what I am doing on the film and by proxy, you know, who are these people in Chicago? Um, I spent about a year just doing research and trying to meet people, and I think I have two uh, subjects in my film who are pretty broadly representative of the type of people who do this work in Chicago. Uh, one would be undocumented immigrants who've come recently from Latin America who, you know, find this work lex exploitative. Uh, they find the way that if they put more effort into it, they make more money in a direct fashion to be better. You know, they make their own hours. They're willing to work hard. And the other would be older people who are sort of neighborhood junk man figures. A lot of these people were fixing this stuff up and reselling it in their communities and stuff like that before the prices went up, before everyone and their mother was trying to get a hold of, you know, scrap that wasn't bolted down and selling it, now they're doing the same thing. You know, they're not fixing it. They're not selling it to their communities because they feel pressured out by these guys. So that's sort of why I picked these two guys in my movie, although mostly I did it just for their human qualities. They're amazing people. Um, I've really enjoyed following their stories. And, um, you know, if you're interested, take a look at our website. The uh, film's going to come out probably in the early part of next year. You can find out uh, how you can see it, how you could buy a DVD, how you could organize a screening, or uh, just get back in touch with me again. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing I did uh, with extraction in the Congo. I'm going to talk about some political and economic questions that are going on right now. This one's in Evanston. Um, they've just sort of got it in their head that they can't uh, bear scrapping anymore because they make a lot of money charging pickup fees for refrigerators, boilers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in some ways, you wonder if that's supposed to be a charge they're leveling on you to pay for the cost of them doing it, but they tend to talk about it as revenue. So I feel like there's a lot of political science or like civics questions involved here. How does this all work? So uh, you guys can read a bit of, you know, more about how I actually structured this problem. And like I did with the other ones, I think it's useful to break down into its component parts. If your students are thinking about political decisions, like are there two or three factors they can consider and will they get a greater understanding of how decisions are made about their world that way? It's, <laughs> it's another thing. It's under, you know, consideration. I think they've gotten a lot of backlash over it. I think maybe a lot of people in Evanston feel overregulated in general, but it, it seems something they might, they might likely do. I know um, Evanston... Uh, banned uh, beekeeping a while ago because of a public safety concern. Um, and this is sort of a two-part issue. Uh, when we're talking about scrappers, you know, we're talking about their revenue source and how we set up our local governments and, you know, how your students can develop their uh, critical thinking capacity and political beliefs. But, you know, we're also dealing with these guys who are informal laborers. Are they a nuisance? Are they a public safety problem? That's why I put this picture right here with this guy with, like, you know, 20 pounds of scrap. I think when a lot of people think about these guys, they may not be thinking about how they're doing the grunt work of the environmental movement. They may be thinking about how this is going to fall and crush them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, can students think about how economic questions matter and can, how can they think about how other broader social questions matter? Uh, another one is theft that people talk about with scrappers. There's plenty of thieves out there. Uh, 
some thieves are scrappers and you know some aren't. People steal all kinds of things. I think if you banned this, uh, the thieves would be the ones who are still doing it and the good people wouldn't be. But I mean, these are all questions you want to think about a lot. You feel a lot different if somebody stole all the gutters off your house. Um, the last part of this question is, is licensing. It's another thing you can think up. There actually is a system in Chicago where you're supposed to be able to get a private junk peddling license and then you, in addition to the trash collectors, are allowed to do this. The system is not at all enforced in Chicago. Uh, I did you know, include this photo I took of the, the, the piece of the law code right there. But it is enforced in a lot of areas around Chicago and they prosecute very heavily. So they make some money that way and in theory they let some people do it who they know they've regulated for traffic reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's another question. What do we think about that? So I want to talk, uh, you know, just briefly about the future when we're thinking about the entire life cycle of medical, uh, metal commodities. We've heard all kinds of uh, sort of peak scenarios at the Summer Institute. So we won't go too much into that. It's, it's sort of just like your ecological footprints. Are we dealing with peak oil? peak water, peak land, peak minerals, um, but it's certainly an interesting concept because when you're talking about any kind of natural resources, even metals which are infinitely recyclable, you got to start thinking about the effects of this huge population on the planet. So, you know, I'm not going to go over these statistics, but it's quite interesting to think about. Um, this piece of uh, data collection was published in 2007, and uh, one of the, the ones on here, I think it's... Um, Indium and hafnium, these are metals that are used in producing the LCD screens we use on our computers, our flat screen TVs. This prediction they've given was like four or five years of hafnium and indium left in the world. That was in 2007, it's 2009. You have to wonder, you know, how come we haven't heard any more news about the impending loss of all our hafnium and indium or how come, you know, our, our cost of TVs and, and computers hasn't gone up. So just like with peak oil, there's a lot of different questions you want to consider. You want to consider how is the pace of discovery of new deposits advancing? How is the discovery of new environmental technologies advancing? How is the discovery of alternative resources to replace things advancing? It's quite a difficult question to come up with a prediction of, you know, when are we going to run out of copper? When are we going to run out of zinc? But it's definitely worth thinking about, and I think if, you, if you're teaching economics, you can go pretty far with it. Um, this graphic's really good. It talks about proportion of consumption met here in the U.S. by our current um, metal usage. Here's a comparison of the U.S. population and the rest of the world uh, via metal consumption. Here's uh, a scenario if demand goes up or down. This one is dealing with current demand. A lot of things you can talk about if you want to consider uh, peak metal or peak mineral resources. Just want to talk briefly about cell phones one more time. Um, it's an interesting concept when you're thinking about metals. Um, Mining in the earth is just separating metals out from the milieu that they're, they're in, and that's really how we should look at recyclable materials, too. There's a huge amount of unused uh, electronics in the U.S., and if they can be put together and profitably um, mined using technology, then we've got something else on our hands, because unlike other resources, metals don't go away. They don't degrade. They're not going to turn into something else. So these are some statistics about what we could get out of our cell phones, you know, 600,000 ounces of gold, 17 million pounds of copper. And uh, this is a bit, and it is worth pointing out that there's currently no technology for reclaiming tantalum, which is coltan, which is the main mineral we we're talking about from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, it seems like technology has not um, advanced far enough to do that with a profit. And like I said, with recycling, we're talking about weight and commodity prices. Nobody's ever going to do it if it's not profitable, which is a bit different from the way I think recycling is just often presented to people. It's something good that a city does for you. You know, it, you know the money's got to be there, and apparently it's not there because uh, such minuscule amounts of tantalum and cassiterite are used in, say, any one device. You know, it's probably some really tiny fraction of an ounce you've got in a capacitor inside your computer. But when you take that on a large scale, you know, look at what we're dealing with in terms of fueling conflict in Central Africa. And I do want to talk a bit about how the work is done on the recycling end, which deals with your question um, earlier. So this is e-waste recycling in China. It's kind of a, a big issue right now. Um, it's, it's done by hand. There's not a lot of labor protection. Stuff is burned. You know, so once this guy's done shipping gold off of a motherboard from a computer, a lot of the plastic and really weird chemical stuff ends up like this. And I mean, you know, photographic evidence, right? 
But um, as usual, we're dealing with trade-offs. I mean, there's big economic questions you'd want your students to think about and instead of just thinking, oh, why do we do that? I mean, uh, in China, you've got a huge migration, huge urbanization. People are lining up around the block to do this kind of work. They have been since the, uh, the uh, freeing of, of the markets in China. But these environmental concerns are on a whole different order, um, as are most things when you talk about Chinese industry and Chinese consumption. But um, just, you know, the sheer sort of amazing capacity of this when you ask your student what happens to your cell phone. Do you really imagine that, you know, there's a 5,000 square foot warehouse full of elderly Chinese women who are picking it all apart by hand? Well, that, that is how it's done. And on a higher note, um, I was talking about how unused metal uh, commodities are like mines. People are just thinking of new things every day. Recycling is kind of a world, you know, where fantasy is able to meet reality. Some really strange schemes about what people are up to. The first is landfills. I was talking about the difference between waste haulers and recyclers. Waste haulers are paid to take things to landfills. But uh, landfills are just in a long term a place where we store resources. Uh, they leak out. They cause big problems with the water supply. But that stuff's all still in there. So currently, um, this was discussed already in this institute where, you know, people harvest methane. Uh, and, you know, the buyers of landfills, the municipalities that host them, are thinking like this in the long term for sure. There's a lot of technology being developed to get metals in particular out of landfills by literally just mining it over again. And then here's a couple of really strange ones. Uh, people in the UK, it's such a dense urban um, accumulation that uh, really rare expensive metals like platinum come out of your catalytic converter, just fall out of the back of your car and really, really, really tiny ink. But they've piled up there enough that if you can get them out of the dust, <clears throat> you've got platinum, which is worth like $1,200 an ounce. And they're doing it with bacteria. You know, who would have thought of that? And the last one that, that I found interesting was from 2007. Um, from the nickel producing area of the world, which is really all in Siberia, um, particularly this one sort of quasi-state run enterprise that produces quite a huge amount of the world's nickel supply, have due to the effects of their industry, uh, you know, so polluted the, uh, the atmosphere that nickel is falling out of the sky and they're picking it up out of puddles. <laughs> and my, my very last final question is pose this to your students. I mean, where could you possibly think to get some more metal? And uh, I think that kind of kind of wraps it up, brings around the entire cycle from beginning to end. Uh, so can I take any questions? Hold on, I'll bring the mic up. Uh, she asked, is my movie done? I'm finishing it this summer. It's currently in post-production. I'm going to be uh, taking it to film festivals next year, seeing who I can get to distribute it. But um, yeah, it'll be ready for screening in the Chicago area probably like the first four or so months of 2010. And they were also abandoned houses from which all the copper piping was removed. Um, many people came up with a, a concept of preventing that from happening by painting the copper pipes because the buyers wouldn't buy it if it had paint on it. Uh, the second thing was that the city of Chicago became aware of the, the, the crisis because copper pr prices jumped from maybe $1,200 to replenish to $2,600 in an overnight. So what the city did was require that any collector or dealer in, in scrap metal must get the name, address, telephone number, and license number of anybody who's delivering it to them. And, and this helps to be, are you aware of that situation? Yeah, very much so. Um, metal theft, I think, I think you're right, particularly with copper, it's, it's not wrong to call it a crisis uh, all over America, all over the world. And uh, this new bill they passed regarding uh, registering at scrapyards, uh, covered in my film actually, I interviewed um, the state senators here in Illinois who put the bill forward and I interviewed uh, quite a lot of sheriffs who are dealing with that scenario. Uh, I, I did kind of gloss over theft a bit, but um, it's, it's a huge issue and, um, you know, commodity prices go up and down and I feel like you want to think um, in a non-deterministic way about what does it mean, you know? Who reacts to it in which different ways? There, there's no easy answers, but, uh, you know, how do we understand it? Um, but uh, it's definitely something worth, you know, teaching as well that uh, in Chicago, especially in harder hit areas of the Rust Belt, like Gary, Detroit, stuff like that, I mean, just whole city blocks are just taken down by people stealing copper piping. Is there um, any stereotype or uh, 
our actual case of theft that's associated, other kinds of theft that's associated with the scrappers? You know, are, are people worried about the scrappers breaking into their homes or breaking into cars? Is that, is there a stereotype about that or is there some reality, some correlation there? Yeah, there absolutely is. And I mean, like most stereotypes, uh, they're based in reality. Um, I think the stereotype is people breaking into either abandoned buildings or new construction and stealing copper piping. And that's the most common thing. But um, there are, you know, a lot of really, you know, strange social consequences being done by, you know, really desperate people who are supporting drug habits that way. People steal train tracks, telephone wires that, you know, affect your emergency service. Um, you know, people electrocute themselves trying to steal wires. Stuff happens quite a bit. But, um, you know, is there a regulatory answer to it? I mean, uh, it's kind of funny when you see things that are like a new part of the economy you didn't think about before, you immediately start thinking about the bad side. And that's why I feel like maybe in, in, in a, uh, an institute on global economics, we just always want to be thinking about trade-offs, right? What, what kind of policy incentives uh, do we need to, to kind of maybe an extraction tax to sort of um, make it more profitable, incentivize the recycling and uh, de-incentivize the, the raw extraction? Uh, well, I think as I was trying to point out, the interesting thing about metals is there isn't uh, a policy incentive necessary because they're so easy and natural to recycle. It's done already to the degree that it possibly can be done. It's a way bigger issue for other kinds of commodities, for sure. But um, I guess with, when you're talking about these sort of things like tantalum and considerate, really complicated question because they're used in such small quantities, it's really hard to make an economics of scale where you can recycle them from cell phones. Uh, there definitely needs to be policy in place to get cell phones recycled because, like I said, they're, they're just not. Um, there's quite a lot of, quite a lot of uh, NGO reports on cell phone manufacturers and how little they're doing to address that. I guess that was I guess I was thinking more like the cradle to cradle model where you you want to design it to be recyclable in the first place, so maybe some regulations on that or some uh, lease approaches where you have a deposit on your cell phone and you get that toward your next one when you take it back. So there's not this toss it in the landfill and remining it, which has got to be the m least efficient <laughs> way. Yeah, I mean, um, any, anything like you were suggesting would be a great solution. I, I was pointing out that these buyback or, I mean, take back programs have been sort of the one piece of legislation foisted on major manufacturers of not just cell phones, but all your electronics that become obsolete overnight is that they have to provide you with this envelope so you can send it back to them. But um, I think people just aren't doing that voluntarily and there definitely needs to be something like you're describing. Um, I, I'm not an expert on e-waste, but there's a huge interest by metal recyclers who are looking uh, you know, towards the money they can get from those very rare minerals in there on how to do it. And I bet they're gonna figure out a way but, uh, you know, for the moment, there really should be something. Uh, it's kind of an obscene culture, how often we replace our cell phones. And, you know, even if you take it back to the cell phone store, they're probably just throwing it away because there's not a profitable way yet. Is there, any way, is there any way for municipalities to capitalize on the recycling movement to make some kind of an incentive for the people to sort their own waste from recyclable materials and then collect it and receive the revenue from them? Well, uh, kind, of, kind of my argument as somebody who spent a lot of time in this world is that no, I'm sort of making the difference between uh, waste haulers, which is a quasi-public industry because it's dealing with you know, land use and water supplies and sort of dangerous public health concerns and recycling. Um, it doesn't really make sense to require people to sort it themselves because they don't have a financial incentive to do it. And then the other thing, if metals or any recyclables are worth tons of money and, you know, you'll have private individuals going out there looking for them, whether it's illegal or not, they're taking the best parts away from the city. So Chicago's blue bag program was, was flawed for quite a lot of reasons, but, but, you know, one problem they're facing is that programs should be funded through the sale of recyclables and metals are worth the most out of all recycling, especially cans. And, you know, people come by and, and skim those off of them. In that same Evanston report, um, I've got a link to the article, you know, they're talking about scrappers stealing their cans. And a lot of people, you know, find this kind of hilarious. Are you stealing their cans? But yeah, you're, you're really stealing the cans. Um, and it's, uh, it's not necessarily gonna work because the incentives uh, aren't really there that way. Um, 
you know, certainly it going to private industry has a lot of uh, trickle-down effects on the way society works. It, it keeps costs cheaper of goods to begin with, but who knows? Uh, it's a big question that, that all American cities are grappling with. Should they even bother recycling? And they're really questioning it now that the commodities markets crashed. They're stuck with these huge program infrastructures. Nobody will buy their goods. They're rotting in warehouses, and they just don't know what to do. So somebody, somebody's got to come up with an answer. <laughs> Could you describe a little bit about the legislation that they were doing with the metals coming from the conflict areas? Um, well, there's there's a new bill, this one I'm talking about, Congo Conflict Minerals Act, that's a little more comprehensive than things have gone on before. So I included some more materials uh, just in the appendix of, of my presentation sort of about uh, corruption and how hard it is to weed out where things come from. So Congo is a country covered with rainforests. It's got 300 miles of roads for a country that's as big as Western Europe. Um, just even by the time it gets to the first middleman, it's, it's sort of nearly impossible to figure out where it came from. Uh, so I think it's good that people are trying it, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure the sanctions are going to work in the same way as they do with, you know, like rubies in Burma or blood diamonds. Um, it's a pretty tricky situation, and what we need is a comprehensive political solution for the Congo. Uh, you know, need the rich countries in the world to live up to their commitments to the UN. I mean, it, it doesn't sort of have to be this way. Can I say one more thing? Um, so in, in post-production of my film, I, I'm in contact with a group called Chicago Educational Technology Foundation. They run something called Chicago Classroom Television, which I think, yeah, maybe some of you guys get, but they're a nonprofit that's devoted to sort of sending social documentary programs to CPS schools, and they do it for free. They set up the equipment. So, um, you know, if my film gets involved in their program, it will probably be coming to your school already. Um, if you don't have Chicago Classroom TV, I, you know, I definitely encourage you to go to their website. Uh, their whole idea is that they provide the setup service for free, and they show, in addition to films that they've helped produce in Chicago, uh, social documentary films, you know, just a wide range of educational stuff, good film programming. You know, I thought of one other thing is that, um, I think doing case studies on the people that are collecting the scrap metal in the neighborhood also invokes a sense of compassion in your students for members of the community that they maybe wouldn't have considered before. And, you know, it might start to open their eyes as to, like, who are these other people around? And, and they're making, trying to make a living like my parents are and my siblings are and I will someday. And, you know, I think it, I, I like that idea of showing their pictures. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really mention it, but I, I sort of see the scrappers as, like, embodying the American dream. Um, just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps through sort of hard work and equal opportunity alone. But they're involved in this world that we just don't understand, which is informal labor, which has a lot of sort of ties to crime and like stuff we'd, you know, we'd rather not think about. But if we want to think about the health of our communities and we want to think about doing positive environmental things, look at what these guys are doing. Um, I included some statistics from uh, trade groups in uh, the scrap recycling industries. In the end of my presentation, you can see just how much is already being recycled uh, of metals sort of under our nose, what a big part of U.S. exports it is, what kind of effect it has on the environment. Uh, you know, I talked about how much earth needs to be moved when you're mining, you know, how much of that's not being done when we recycle stuff. And uh, where does the metal come from? Well, a lot of it comes from these guys. Thank you so much, Brian.